Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to the Q&A with Dr. Louisa Wei this uh, afternoon. Uh, and it's evening in uh, Hong Kong where Louisa is. So my name is Mason Lai. Uh, I am the chairman of Wulan Foundation Network. It is a small charity. Uh, it was founded uh, about just over 10 years ago, and it was named after the legendary Hua Mulan. So what we do is we give awards to uh, top successful Chinese or half Chinese women from around the world. Uh, and they will then be connected with younger Chinese women on their way up so that together they can work together uh, to help each other and also to give back to the wider community. So today's event is part two uh, of a two-part event that Dr. Human Chen, the founder of UK China Film Collect, has uh, set up for us. Uh, it is part of the uh, China cinem cinema season. So last night, some of you attended the first part, which was a documentary uh, on the life and the works of Esther Eng. Actually, her, her real surname is Ng Eng, but because a lot of Europeans have difficulty in trying to pronounce Eng, some pronounce Ning Eng, whatever, uh, she added the E to it, so she's known as uh, Esther Eng. Now, what is truly remarkable about Esther is that she was born in the um, 19, in 1914, and she made her films in the 1930s and 1940s. And uh, I know from my uh, aunties who were born in the 1920s that when they were growing up, they were not even allowed to look out the window. That was sort of how uh, Chinese ladies, the Chinese women, the fascinating and amazing that Esther Eng went on to make all those films, uh, not just in America, but also uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, and therefore, uh, we are very fortunate that Louisa found out about her uh, and made this very interesting and fascinating documentary uh, about her life. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Human, who will introduce Dr. Louisa Wei, and uh, all about uh, Esther Eng and about the film industry and how uh, all this has come about. So, so uh, Thank you very much for joining us today. And over to you, Human. Thank you very much, Maisin. Thank you for, for your very warm welcome and for the support uh, from Mulan Foundation uh, to the screening and Q&A event. Um, so the screening and the Q&A is part of the ongoing Chinese cinema season. It's the largest online film festival for Chinese language film in the UK and in the EU. You still have about uh, 15 days, I think, to watch the films that we are screening, including Golden Gate Girls, and also to catch up some of our panels and Q&As uh, um, that we have done so far. The festival, Chinese Cinema Season, is co-presented by Trinity Cine Asia, Filming East Fest Film Festival, and also UK China Film Collab. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our guest today, Dr. Louisa Wei, all the way from Hong Kong, uh, zooming in with us and to join us to talk about her film. Hello, Louisa. Hi. It's very so, happy to meet everyone. Thank you. I'm going to introduce a little bit more about Louisa. So Louisa Wei is an associate professor at the City University of Hong Kong, a documentary filmmaker, and a member of the Hong Kong Directors Guild. 
she writes intensively about Chinese female directors and women directors, uh, women cinema, having published many articles, book chapters, and encyclopedia entries, and two books on this particular topic. Her two feature films, documentary, feature documentary, Golden Gay Girls, and also Havana Divas, respectively focusing on how Chinese language films and Cantonese opera traveled in North and Latin America in the 1920s and the 1960s. Both films have received positive reviews and reports from major media such as The Hollywood Reporter, the BBC, and so on. In writing Chinese intellectual history, Dr. Wei has also published two books uh, and made one feature film called Storm Under the Sun. So it is our pleasure and honor today to have Dr. Louisa Wei to join us today. For those who haven't seen the film, I really recommend you to see it, to catch it before um, it disappears. So about Golden Gay Girls, I'm going to start off some questions for myself, and then I'm going to open it to the audience for them to join in as well. How did you first encounter this fascinating topic? I know that you, you in the film, you say a box of uh, photographs and archival materials were, were found in, in the United States, and then it was donated to, to you. But how did that connection come about? Yeah, when I was a PhD student, I know uh, women directors, they existed, and but they were never written into the history that much, even the very important early ones. And so there was always um, the father of a certain cinema, certain national cinema, but there was no mother of it. Um, for example, in the US, Everybody knows D.W. Griffiths is the uh, father of American cinema, but nobody knows Louis Weber, who is also so important and um, also very productive and also very controversial. Um, so this is this is why I make um, a decision after I came to Hong Kong, started to teach that I'm going to focus more of my future research on women directors instead of male directors. It's not that male directors was not important. It was because there were really like not so many people devoted to, to it. But then uh, it turned out to be um, a very productive kind of research because with the digitization of uh, older newspapers around the world, and then you find that uh, there were actually many women directors and they were uh, widely reported by the news of her time. They were just forgotten easily later on. So with um, Esther Ng, I already knew the name when I first came to Hong Kong in 2001. Um, then I was able to talk to my producer, Loka, who already published a book chapter on Esther's story. And um, it was like in every way she's fascinating because um, nobody imagined Hong Kong's first female director was an American citizen, third generation uh, San Francisco born raised Chinese women. And uh, even, even in Hollywood, and it was something unimaginable um, because they wouldn't think someone like Esther just uh, existed, like it may seem, um, just mentioned like, uh, you know, like uh, your older generations in the family and they have limitations. And how come like uh, Esther walk around in a male, like uh, attire and open gay? It's not that gay was so welcomed at the time. And she went around making movies in Hong Kong and nobody think that she should come out of the closet. So this this become another another question raised like are we more open nowadays than the 1920s and 1930s? So all these like historical research just keep giving me uh, new insights into things and um, help me to relocate uh, the history of women and also like uh, how to see the world and how to see the gender balance or imbalance. And um, or how much like uh, courage matters in somebody's life when you're a young woman and you thought of making movie and then you just did it. 
And uh, then the, in her middle age, when she was 30 something, and she thought of opening a restaurant, so the uh, traveling Cantonese opera players could have a place to eat. And then she started a restaurant. And the restaurant became so famous in New York that when she died and uh, her obituary was about her as a uh, restaurateur, basically, uh, in uh, 1970, and her obituary published in New York Times, and how many um, Chinese American could do that. And Variety, of course, also published her obituary because of her early filmmaking career. So this is um, like um, basically everybody who found out the story about her just, just were blown away by her story. It was like so amazing and nobody ever imagined. And they all imagined the boundaries, the blocks, the limitations. But nobody imagines somebody can just cross over like that, like her. Yeah. Sorry, when you received that uh, box of archival materials and photographs, how did you feel? How, what was the first um, emotion that you had? Um, actually, uh, me and my producer had a talk before that, before the photo actually arrived in Hong Kong. And I said to him, if we have, if I have those photos, we could perhaps make a film because we need an image to make a film. And we know there were 600 photos in, uh, in that box. So the box falling into my hand is uh, really, it was very interesting because I scanned the photos, I bring my laptop and I went around and I show people the, um, the photographs. They recognize their parents, their family, their friends there. And uh, then um, they all think, Oh, Louisa did so much research, but that was the part that just, I didn't do any research. It just fell into my hand. But uh, uh, people say that because they think it's hardly get, like it's very um, hard earned uh, material. And then they open up to me, even though I was a total stranger. Can you imagine me showing up in front of you, open up my laptop and show a picture of your father or mother when, when she was in her 20s, right? And then, then you could have a lot to speak to me. So, so I mostly got uh, interviews that way, except for like, uh, of course, the researchers, but then uh, old, old Esther's friend, I got it in that way, yeah. So maybe that's the destiny because you yourself also are a female film director, so maybe you are the perfect person to make this happen. And I guess when you receive something like that, it's very difficult to say no. It, it, it makes you, I think it makes you feel like you have to do something with this very precious material. You have to tell the story to the world about this amazing woman. Right. So how was the journey for you, personal journey for you um, in making this film as well, for your own reflection as a female director um, in the industry? The, the journey started um, with lots of uncertainties, just like the beginning of the film, and I didn't even know who I can find. And uh, when I first time going to, uh, the first time I went to New York, the person we pre-contacted has a stroke a few days before I arrive. And then so, so we couldn't interview, we couldn't find him until like um, much later. And so we give him a bit interview and he was, um, you know, in a, in a sort of a pajama like um, kind of, a, and he talked very slowly because he just had a, just recovered from a stroke. And the other Cantonese opera uh, player we pre-contact found out that we want to make a film about Esther, not about him. And he got so mad, he kicked us out. <laughs> So, um, so those were like uh, what happened in the first time. So when I went back from my first trip, which took place in 2009, my project got stuck there until like two years later. And then, then um, somebody else came around and say, oh, you want to find Esther Ng's friend? I know her friends very well. And say, I'm going to New York in March. And that was in uh, January when I met him. So I said, I'm going with you to New York in March. And um, so we went again in um, March 2011. And um, the, the old man in Hawaii that um, uh, we interviewed was 
we don't know if she, he knows Esther or not. We actually didn't uh, didn't know, but Esther's name popped up in in his mouth, and we're so happy. I was so happy. I was just holding out my laugh. You know, I really wanted to laugh at that that moment. So it was an amazing and um, it was an amazing journey. And when I was in uh, San Francisco and met Todd McCarthy, who's uh, the top film critic of the variety before, and the variety sort of uh, didn't keep him. And uh, so he became a film critic for The Hollywood Reporter. And he received me and he has doubts whether I could find, but everybody just sort of having me there and just say, good luck, Louisa. <laughs> like, let's see what you can, what you can find. You know, like then everybody was like uh, very curious because um, uh, the 10 years research, uh, my producer and um, an Australian gentleman whose name is Frank Brain, who passed away and they were all sharing their contact with me and sharing their research with me. Otherwise, um, you know, like the pre-newspaper digitalization age, if you want to find a piece of news about Esther, you probably flip over like 10 years of New York Times to do something to find a few pieces of a news article. It was, it was that hard. Right now it's like a much easier. Then I, I, I find more and then I try to, I have the box of pictures. So I have her image and I worry about, I'm only going to make a film with her image, but not with her voice in it. So I spend a lot of time spend trying to imagine how her voice was reconstructed. And all of us, I think we have like a pictures of our grandparents, grandmother, especially. And they all have like images. They all women always exist in images, but how to find their voice? This is something that uh, you know I I spend some time with. And then I was checking with everybody, like say, did you hear Esther speak after they watched like an earlier version of my my film, basically? Yeah. But there's a very tentative um, detail that you mentioned about a voice because in your documentary you also had an extensive. Uh, archival materials about Anna Mae Wong, you know, one of the first, um, uh, almost like an exotic, exotic symbol for Oriental female actress in Hollywood. No, not many people know how she sounds. You know, we all know how she looks, but we you just don't really can't imagine what she sounded like. Especially she was working in the silent era as well. So, how did you come about the the, the voiceover for the commentary? Was it a very specific um, choice too? It was like. Um... Yeah, it's, it's, it, it was like, I basically looked for someone who looked like Esther and um, then, um, uh, you know, like have them to dub one paragraph in English and one paragraph in, in Chinese to sort of imitate how she talk. But uh, Anime Wang was um, another amazing figure because um, when Hollywood turned her down from leading uh, roles, she actually came to uh, Germany and came to UK. And she was on stage with uh, Lawrence Oliver. Like uh, you, you just couldn't, like uh, you, you couldn't imagine that she was doing it. And uh, Lawrence Oliver was playing the yellow face and, uh, you know, be a supportive act. And he was such a great, like a, uh, you know, British actor uh, later on in Hollywood. And, um, the the UK audience didn't receive her very well because she has a Chinese face, but then she sounds like Californian. And then they were like, what's wrong with this this act actress, basically? So she had a, a language coach from Cambridge and she changed her English accent permanently to a British accent. And later on, ironically, she was imported as an European talent back to Hollywood because of her accent. I think her accent, uh, accent did a lot about that. So, uh, so I was thinking um, Esther, Esther was must relate to Anime Wong in a sense. And I doubt because uh, their names were like 
you know, too similar. So I thought Bruce Bruce Wong, who co-produced the uh, Hard X with Esther, was uh, who's the brother-in-law of Esther was a cousin of Anne Mei Wang. And so they, they must have, it's a very small uh, Chinese community uh, back in California in, in those years. But because I couldn't find any evidence, I just leave it there. And, uh, but I'm sure the whole California and Chinese community were inspired by Anime Wang. But I was using her as a, um, um, like as a benchmark for her race, even someone as talented and good looking as Anime Wang could not be a director, could not sustain a career in Hollywood. So it was kind of a smart choice for Esther to go to uh, HK to become, to go to Hong Kong to become a director. She couldn't, she couldn't have done it in the US. <laughs> Without going going to Hong Kong and with the support from Hong Kong, definitely. That's, that's right. I think yes. in your documentary, it confirms several things already. Um, for some of the research that I'm doing myself about James Wong Hao, which is the first cinematographer, mm -hmm. cinema uh, cameraman in in Hollywood, I was trying to find a connection between James Wong Hao and Adam Wong and Esther Ng. <laughs> we know we know that they had some encounters, but then whether they were friends or not. So in your documentary, it confirms that the Chinese community in Hollywood, um, in, in California at that time, they were very supportive towards each other. And, and it's by default that they all knew each other um, in that sense. Exactly. And I think before I'm going to show the trailer, because I would like to show the trailer to those who haven't seen the film, just as a little tease uh, for you. Um, I think you and Esther Ng, both of you share a similar spirit, and I, I guess that extends to a diaspora or diasporic Chinese women as well. It's that fighting spirit, that just going forward, even though without knowing what is going uh, going to happen ahead, you know, just you just charge forward and explore the uncertainty, and it is that uncertainty that is is almost like a hook or almost like a drive um, for. Um, Chinese women overseas to make a career for themselves. And so I think definitely I can see that in you as well. And, and that makes sense why you are so fascinated about this topic too, in a way, as a female director. Thanks. By all means, do go on www.chinesefilm.uk to check out the film if you haven't seen it yet. Personally, I really recommend it. And I think it's a rare gem and it's a really um, precious documentary to recall a history that not many people know, but I think that all people who care about culture and Chinese heritage should know. So I have some more questions here before I open up to the floor uh, for you, Louisa, um, from our audience last night. Why was Esther not included initially in the list of female producers in the USA, including in her obituary in 1970? Uh, was it because of lesb lesbianism, um, not being accepted by her family or friends? And why was she not mentioned as a producer in her later films with Wu Pang? Um, when we're when, when we're doing the research, and we found um, really strange that her co-directors didn't mention her. And then when we're doing more research on other women directors, and we found out the same thing. I think it was a, a systematic um, obli oblivion of like uh, the female directors in a sense. So it's not just happening in the US or happening in China, it's happening everywhere. I think the only place a little bit better is in France because um, in, in France, there was a, a woman director like uh, from the very beginning, Alice Guy Blachet, and he, she is like uh, the world's first uh, female director. So they, they, I don't know if they keep the respect for women directors, but there is at least uh, one woman directing every major trend in France. But um, everywhere else was like uh, all sort of uh, first, uh, like um, uh, they were all, very much reported. The media love them because the media can run the title. The only woman director or the first woman director, they do this all the time. Oh, the director is a woman. They all did with such excitement. So it's not the responsible, 
uh, responsibility of the media is the people who are afterwards, like the critics, the historians, they were the ones who forgot them. And uh, they're, they're co-workers sometimes. But um, the particular mentioning of the co-worker is a game that I want to play with my audience because I leave a question there. And then so in almost a, each screening, there will be at least a one audience member ask me why. And I said, that's my question for my audience, actually. Why? <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> so maybe on that, we can start to open open up to the floor to get um, our audience to participate and share their view on this. Macy might want to say something on this, I think. You're... Let me just... Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just. Oh, it's it's off again. Okay. Let me just. I just want to ask Louisa about sort of the opportunities uh, for women directors. Uh, the fact that Chloe uh, Zhao. Mm -hmm won the Oscar for Nomadland, and she's won many other awards. That's been very inspirational uh, to women, uh, also to Chinese women. So I'm just going to ask whether, are there more opportunities uh, in, in the East uh, for Chinese women directors? And also the whole film industry in China has grown so much in the past 20 years. So I'd be interested in Louis' views uh, in this area because uh, it's certainly a sector which is very exciting, especially for um, young people. Well, uh, I think Esther set up uh, like a very good example in Hong Kong. And ever since uh, Esther, the trajectory of women directors in Hong Kong was never broken. It was not like Japan or um, Korea or Taiwan. It was like in Hong Kong was pretty good since Esther's time. There was always at least one important woman director working and uh, being very prolific. You can't just make two films and go away and you have to stay there with at least 10 films. So we had that in Hong Kong. And uh, in China, uh, interestingly, it was the socialist system ensured uh, a percentage of women being admitted to the directing class of Beijing Film Academy since the 1950s. And then uh, these women um, because they are supposed to hold up half of the sky, like a Chairman Mao said. And so they were, um, they were playing a very important role in filmmaking. So they were holding up the mainland Chinese. Um, so I guess in, uh, in Chinese film industries, it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. It was much better than the American film industry and how they treated women and how women were never getting any awards and uh, until like, uh, you know, uh, five years ago. So, um, so it wasn't, it wasn't so bad in here, actually, not, not from Esther's time even. Yeah. Okay. That, thank you. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mason, for your question. Do we have any questions from the audience? So if you, do you have something to ask, Louisa? You can either type in the chat or you can unmute yourself just to just to jump in, in the conversation. Mariana? Yes. Okay. Um, Louisa, I'd like to ask you a question. I think on the top that this um, producer, filmmaker, she was able to make films, but on the top of it, she was openly open about her sexuality. That was a double whammy at that time, I can only imagine. And the way um, it's it, it's quite interesting that the um, publicity 
didn't mind they they acknowledged that she had a short bob and she dressed as a man but i was really surprised she was not openly attacked for her preferences i am surprised that at that time there was so not necessarily accepting but there, she was not attacked about it and um it, so that's that's my kind of i was wondering about that as i was watching the film and the second uh, thing is um how how do you think that um this is just my opinion do you think that she preferred to dress in a certain way and express certain uh, create certain personality about herself in order to match with the man in order not to be different than the man at least to be in the same to be treated at least as a man so that was another um sort of her image was to match with the man rather than because being a woman at the time maybe wasn't as uh, complimentary as being man like figure so that's her power because she didn't want it to be so this is just my questions mm -hmm. so once how come she was not prosecuted from being female gay and number two, do you think she was influenced her her image of being male like was because that then in that case she can match professionally with a man i mean um i look at all her pictures and um are you aware of like a dorsey osnar like before this film and dorsey osnar who was um perhaps an inspiration to astor and she was um making films from the from 1919 in uh, Paramount Pictures in Hollywood. And Dorsey Osner was also in uh, Golden Gate Girls in my film as well. The reason I um, I put her there was because uh, she was the only other person who could perhaps inspire like uh, Esther. And um, because I, I was aware of Dorsey first, when I first saw Esther's picture, I thought they look identical with their style. And one more person who looks like them was uh, Sakane Tasuko, who's Japan's first woman director, who started, uh, uh, who made only one, one feature film, who directed only one feature film in 1936. So they were contemporaries. At that time, um, being a lesbian, if you're dressing in pants, it's very alarming. Uh, it's not like nowadays. Nowadays, uh, professional women all just take up the lesbian fashion from her time. That's the lesbian fashion that uh, Dorsey Osner and, and Esther Ng was um, showcasing, basically. And um, I don't think Esther was just dressing up as a man. I think she was, she think herself as a boy. <laughs> And uh, she's she's really gay, but uh, the matter of of gay in the nineteen twenties was more open than nowadays. With uh, Melina Dietrich uh, being famed as the busiest bisexual in Berlin, and uh, with something going on between like her and uh, Anime Wang, which was like a big gossip in the film industry at the time. And then there was another like a gay, very famous like a gay director in Hollywood. And recently, I think people start to unveil this kind of thing with a Netflix, uh, with a Netflix series called Hollywood. It's, it's recent and it's showing these early figures. It also included Anime Wang in there. And so uh, in the 1930s, they were still pretty open about it. And plus, because they were working behind the screen and not on the screen, if you're on the screen and it might be a problem because um, then the, the gossip become, you know, who, whose name is on the marquee, right? But if you work behind the scene, if you're Chinese, if you're a woman, if you're gay, and it's less of a problem because most of the, the mass audience did not like know so much about that. And when I look at Dorsey Osner's early pictures, she still wear a dress when she graduated from high school. 
uh, and she still has the kind of like a suit and a skirt. But Esther, <laughs> Esther only had like about five pictures. Like she has a a, a skirt, but then uh, you know uh, all the other she was in pants from very early from very early on. And of course, if you are a um, a female director like Sakane Tasuko, the Japanese one, and she was told by the director who's who's her like a master or mentor um, that you should wear pants because it's easy for you to work. You need to climb up here and there and you need to go around. Um, it has a bit of that, like, uh, you know, the, the Dorsey Asnar also said what she wears was the only thing she feels appropriate uh, to wear in a movie set. But, but Esther just didn't go through that. And we don't know if she did because uh, um, the only thing we could get about her was from newspapers. They, they didn't say anything about that. And also because uh, Hong Kong already had um, the Mulan tradition <laughs> for the, uh, of cross-dressing and uh, with, um, with Cantonese opera. Uh, in her time in the 1930s, the most popular were the old female theater where all the men were played by women as well. So I guess it was a less of, it's not such a big deal in that time. But of course, everybody know that she was a woman. Then this is why like some of the reporters writing very alarmingly that, um, you know, but I, I, I didn't want to call her brother Ha because I know she's a woman, but I didn't want to upset her. So I just nod to her every time I see her like uh, stuff like that, or, or, oh, they were also sleeping in the same bed with uh, like all her affair with the, the actresses were followed very closely. And this was the same with Dorsey Asner as well. At the beginning, I didn't know how to deal with Esther's like a uh, um, lesbianism or her like uh, homosexuality. And this is why like I went to see uh, Judy's men after reading her book on Dorsey Asner. And because her book got me alarmed because uh, Dorsey Asner was sort of uh, the inspiration of fam film feminism in the US because she was the only Hollywood woman director who was there. Like uh, you have the gays theory, you have all these like a uh, theory about um, uh, women make film, but then you don't have women directors, right? But when Judy's men wrote about Dorsey Asnar, and I, I noted that in the beginning of the, her book, she found out from her files, Dorsey Asner's files, that a picture of a home shared between Dorsey Asner and her partner. And Judith was so happy about it. She didn't say why. So I asked Judith and said, why are you so happy about it? I thought, unless you are also lesbian and uh, that home means a lot to you, and uh, then it happened, it's, so it happens, right? And uh, so, so Judith was written with care because that the lesbianism about Dorsey Asner was the last aspect that feminist film scholars going into during their early research. So I went to Judith and I learned how to read a, like a, a woman director or lesbian director learned a lot from Judith and I just like interviewed her after my film already shown in a Hong Kong International Film Festival. And uh, I sent her DVD, she connected uh, in the sense that, um, you know, they, um, it remind her, remind her of her searching for Dorsey Asner, of my searching of Esther In. So, so we kind of have the connection there and then, then she was also interested in uh, Malina Dietrich. That's how she noticed Anime Wang, that she could make a few comments about Anime Wang as well. So, so this is how like the pieces of puzzles all sort of fall together in here. Does that answer your question? Yes, it has. And um, last question, I just 
want to admire it's not it's not like a question it's more like admiration that she made a film with 36 women in it so literally exactly. there was no men so this is a completely opposite of misogyny this yes. is this is like uh, femininity all the way through so that's um it's, it's just this courage it's just some mentioning something like that will stay with me for for the rest of my life because quite often in in west now we still um saying the women have a roles to be just in bed or in the bath or something like that so, um objectif object objectification of the woman body and here she just went all the way through and just said that's it 36 actors all women go for it it's just so amazing and especially at that time so i, I really right. like that point in the yes. film and and her film is called the 36 amazons and i'm thinking of yes. the wonder woman <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And there's only one where 36. So is it possible to view any of those films? So there is an archive somewhere where you can view them? Uh, the film was actually showing, uh, it, it was distributed in North America by Women Make Movies, which is a very long time like distributor of women directors film. It was also streaming on Canopy and uh, also also had a streaming on a uh, Cathy play. Uh, Cathy play is is the new home new home to a uh, Golden Gate girl and Havana divas recently. So if you Thank have you. friends interested, you could uh, recommend Cathy play and um, just a few dollars and you can see the film. Um, would you would you be able to um, send us the link? Yes, yes. To, yeah, I'll send to maybe human Mason. or yeah. But cassieplay.com already has like um just the the film. I think we need to inspire more and more yes. next generation and next yes. generation of women to be brave and independent and uh -huh. and fearless. That's right. Yes. And thank you so much for your film. Um you're showing that although we think we're doing progress now, yes. there's a lot of progress has been man made in the previous years That's by right. those women, as you said, who became obsolete or invisible yes. or taking out of history. So uh -huh. then we don't have to say that we are the most advanced because advances have already happened. We just not, never been, we never learn about those advances that have already happened before. That's Thank right. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Before, as one of the uh, festival's co-organizer, I have to jump in that before you go on to Cafe Play, you can still see the film at Chinese Cinema Season, and it's streaming until until um, the 23rd of May. Is Luisa let us to play a little bit longer? Originally, the deadline was um, originally the deadline was the 12th of May, so we can go on Chinese Cinema Season um, to view the film both films there. Um, we have a question from the audience saying that, how did you develop the idea of using animation into intro for each chapter of your film? Uh, the animation was designed um, with a vehicle uh, of some sort of transportation because Esther was traveling all the time. So I saw like uh, each of her traveling to a new place as a new chapter of her life. It was sort of designed that way. And and I also give a bit room for my composer to show off his multi talent with different style of music, with the nineteen thirties San Francisco jazz and then the the big band music from Hollywood and Chinese style and later on nineteen fifties like a uh, uh, New York so so he could show like different style of music that he could compose as well. So um, I thought that would be like a, you know, a kind of a nice break for, for the audience in between the narrative. Yeah. Thank you, Louisa. And I think we have another question from the audience, uh, Cedric Farrell from Trinity Cine Asia. So for those who don't know, Trinity Cine Asia is uh, the largest distributor for Chinese language films in the UK and Europe, and also the co-organizer of our film festival currently. Cedric. Hi, uh, Luisa, hi. Hi. Thank you very much for your film. It was an amazing uh, 
doing it and I learned so much from it. Um, and I wanted to ask a question as a di distributor because we, um, you know, we, we release Chinese films in the UK, but also in Russia and CIS, and we're looking to expand. But Esther, Esther was releasing films from Hong Kong in the US uh, as a distributor in the 20s already. So, and from the documentary, that's a business she had from her father. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. And is that how, because I was thinking, it's not, it can't be a coincidence that the only, uh, you know, director, female Chinese director in the US at that time making films was also a distributor. So I sort of wondered how much does that have an effect in her filmmaking? And because she obviously must have been very aware of her market and therefore she, she could have this direct connection with the audience that I guess no one else could have in such an intimate way. Yes. She, uh, she's a businesswoman, so she never makes film that is not going to make money. That's why she kind of stopped to make film after 1949, when the Cantonese opera players all sort of went back to uh, China and to Hong Kong. Because um, without all those like uh, Cantonese opera stars, she, she couldn't make a, a sale. Uh, like a, you have to have a star that the audience recognize, and then right. she she make use of those traveling opera stars, and um, uh, in Cantonese film, uh, the opera stars playing um, a role in a movie is um, is a normal practice in the nineteen forties and fifties and sixties. So she was a pioneer, not just as a filmmaker, but also as a distributor, which is quite interesting mm -hmm. because. Uh, and and also I mean, I mean just just it's not a question but just a point is that it's very sad in a way that when she made her last film she was younger than Chloe Zhao uh, making her films now. That's right. Yeah. Mm. So there was a lot more films in her, I guess, that she that she didn't get to make. Did did she did she really when she was in New York and settled and in the restaurant business did she just put the film business behind her? Not, not really. She she did make one film in uh, 1960. That was her last film. Yeah, but I mean, after that, was she uh, not interested in uh, engaging? Or because there was, you know, after, at that time, independent filmmaking was growing in, in the U.S. and you, you had, you right. know, filmmakers like Shirley Clark, for example, operating out of New York. Yes. Uh, she was not interested in being that scene anymore. Was she just past it or? I mean, she's interested in making a film, but like like I said, the condition was not good for making film in the U.S. for a Chinese audience, not for that anymore. She could just import the film from Hong Kong. And uh, okay. she opened a, a, a movie theater that was also used as an opera stage in New York as well. So she organized uh, some opera troops to come to New York to have a visit and then um, put them on performance on the stage in Central, Central Theater in New York. So, so and, and also in, uh, in my other film, Havana Divas, the, the Cuban ladies, when they're watching movies, Chinese movies, when they grow up, lots of the movies were distributed to Havana by Esther Ng. She, she nice. would have personally uh, brought the film to go there and um, then, the, you know, the Golden Eagle Theater, where the, the Cuban divas perform, were also showing the films that Esther Ng uh, personally um, had taken to, to Cuba. Mm. Yeah. Such an extraordinary life. That's right. Yes. But, yes. But it, it's, it's, it's sad in a way that you didn't make the transition to making films for a bigger audience, an American audience. I mean, American audience were not ready for it. And did, did Esther never try to make an English language film? Uh, I mean, she, she couldn't. She couldn't. Um, just no one just break in as like in Hollywood as a Chinese and in the post of director, not even James Wong Hao. James Wong Hao was a two time uh, Oscar winner cinematography, and all he directed was a 12 minutes film. I, I think I'm just going to jump in there. If, that James Wong Howe, again, is such an uh, extraordinary figure. Two time Oscar winners for uh, the best cinematography, ten, 10 times nominations for that, and no single Chinese 
artist or filmmaker has achieved that in that. And and also the, the reason why is because it connects to what you were saying earlier on, because it works behind the scene. As long as you work behind the scene, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is, Hollywood doesn't care. They want the best, they want to make the best picture. But as long as it's go on screen for the public to see something that's different or out of their comfort zone, then it becomes a, it becomes a problem. And that's why in the Netflix Hollywood series, they Anime One was saying that she couldn't win any awards because she was she was a Chinese woman. She she's a, she was she has that oriental face. So it's very interesting. So they wanted to Hollywood almost like they wanted to take the best skills, but they don't want you to give you the recognition on screen or give you the representation of it. Right. Um, like that. Right. I think it's a, a, con- a nice gesture that Netflix uh, Hollywood at least, um, you know, acknowledge um, anime one not being able to uh, be casted for the good earth, which mm. was a very good casting, but a very tragic result which also resulted in her traveling to China for the first time, but she couldn't speak much Chinese. That's her problem. Yeah. Yeah. If we, do we have any more questions? I'm a bit conscious of time and it's getting late for Louisa as well. What is your next project, Louisa? Uh, I'm, I'm making a film on uh, the Chinese rock and roll. And I was, I was telling, uh, human about it and um, um thank you very much to uh, both human uh, and also to louisa uh, both women who are doing wonderful pioneering work in the whole sort of development of uh, chinese women in in films uh, there's sort of a lot to do i know that human's doing a lot uh, with her not-for-profit company she found that UK China uh, film collapse. And I know that I chair television for the environment, and uh, she has been extremely helpful with various suggestions. And I think today we're very pleased uh, to have Karma Wangdi, who is the operations director of television for the environment, join us uh, for this session. Uh, I think sort of the two events, the screening last night and today's Q&A has given us a really fascinating picture, an idea of uh, what a truly amazing person Esther Eng was. Uh, She did a lot, uh, like Mulan. Not not really. She she did make one film in... uh... 1960, that was her last film. It was such a shame that, you know, she was forgotten uh, until her photographs were found and then something uh, was done uh, about telling the world about all that she uh, has done. So I would like to thank Louisa very, very much indeed for the excellent work that she has done on this and still continuing to do on it. And also I wish her all the very best with her exciting new projects. And uh, once again, I thank Human uh, for uh, giving Mulan the opportunity uh, to be the beneficiary of these two uh, events. We are a small charity. Uh, we are always sort of looking for support. It doesn't have to be in money, but it can be in kind if you know people who have got the time. So thank you all very much indeed. And thank you to, to uh, the audience today for attending and for supporting this event. So I wish you all the very best and hope you will keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.